so what did i mean when i said the snake in genesis chapter 3 is not a snake as we know it it's because of the words that are used you know i've been looking at um the original words of the bible and i'm beginning to realize that the original words of the bible actually have slightly different meanings than the way we understand words i mean in english you know so when you look at the words that and the structure uh, of genesis chapter 3 there are something that you see that that begins to make you question this is what it says uh, chapter 3 it says now the serpent was more crafty than any other beasts of a field that the Lord God had made. So the word here, the word serpent here, when we look at it, is actually the word nakash. And this word, it, it, it means a couple of things. The word nakash, N-A-C-H-A-S-H. It, 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 as a light noun, it means a snake, like the way we understand what a snake is. And that's as a light noun. And as a verb, it means someone who practices divination or someone who deceives through divine knowledge you know as a verb someone who practices divination or someone who deceives through divine knowledge and the third meaning is the shining one as if bronze glowing in a fire you know so and i say in akash i mean someone or a being that is shining as if bronze glowing in in a fire so those are the three meanings of the word nakash or this the word serpent that is used here i think i've seen one bible actually not using the word snake using the shining one it says now the shining one and you know that in bible school they say that um, if we, we we want to invest or to investigate a, a certain subject that appears uh, to be a bit obscured we must go and look at other verses you know they call it the principle of cross-referencing so uh, when we apply the principle of cross-referencing we begin to uh, meet other verses in the bible that kind of sheds a light of what is happening here so what do we have in genesis chapter 3 in genesis chapter 3 we have a shining one who deceives someone and this shining one was cast by god and God said to him, he will eat the dust of the earth. Do we have something similar in the Bible that, that alludes to this? So basically, in Isaiah um, chapter 14, we, we understand that uh, it's talking about a physical situation that has happened on earth. But in verse 12, this language is funny. When it says, how you have fallen from heaven, a morning star, you know. Uh, so when you look at that word, morning star is... Halal ben Shekar, you know, and the Bible never addresses men like that, you know. So it's a similar thing to the one that the, 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 the what Genesis is saying when he said the serpent, uh, the shining one. So, so here we also have a shining being, you know, uh, the shining one, son of the dawn, you know, Halal ben Shekar. So we have the shining one in Genesis chapter 3, we have a shining one again here. Let's now go to Ezekiel, you know, Ezekiel. We say yes, me, I say yes. This chapter uh, speaks of the king of terror, you know, physical king that once existed in history. But we become challenged when we get to verse 14 and we begin to see something funny again that the Bible does not normally ascribe uh, to people. Verse 14 it says, You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for I ordained you. You know, there's no way in scripture where. Uh, the word cherub is used in the reference to a man you know so this begs us to question what is what is happening here so basically Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel uh, 28 we apply they call it the law of double reference you know what is the law of double reference the law of double reference is remember in Isaiah um, 60 or 61 i think Isaiah says the spirit of the lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor and liberty you know you remember that scripture and then christ in luke 4 the bible says they gave him a scroll and then he read it and as the spirit of the lord has anointed me uh, to do one two three one two three open the eyes of the blind one two three one two three you know reading it for himself so he and then he says today this scripture has been fulfilled in front of your eyes but Isaiah he said this thing about himself in Isaiah chapter 60 or 61 I'm not sure so that's called 
the law of double preferency. So Ezekiel 28 is talking about the king of terror, yes. But uh, verse 14 causes us to take a step back, you know, and, and see why, why is it saying you were, anoint, you were anointed as a guardian cherub? Where in scripture uh, have we ever seen a man being referred to as a guardian cherub? Then this is where the law of double referencing come into play. Anyway, back to my comparing Genesis chapter 3 with Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel. So here, obviously, it says yeah, you are anointed as a guardian cherub. And then we all know that uh, part of the distinguishing things about uh, cherubs uh, is that they are burning uh, as if they are bronze. You know, so the same explanation that we find in Genesis 3. So we find the shining one also here. Now, the second point is that when it says when God was declaring the curse to this uh, being that he did, that deceived Adam and Eve, he said that um, on your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. For us, unfortunately, this statement means a snake crawling on the ground but for the the first recipient of this letter when they would read uh, this phrase they would understand it as a complete defeat even below to the earth the the bible uses the statement uh, and when they, it uses it it uses it as complete defeat and that defeat is not just a defeat i mean it's a defeat that even extends below the earth that's what we see here we see below the earth here or at least we see an insinuation of it uh, here in genesis chapter 3. so let's go back to isaiah and see if we find something like that and ezekiel and see if we find something like that wait before we we go to below the earth you know let's just quickly establish something in genesis chapter 3 where is the shining one this shining one is in the garden of eden uh, when we come to uh, ezekiel we see a similar language also uh, used uh, in in verse 13 it says uh, you were in eden the garden of god so this shining one in ezekiel 28 is is also insinuated actually explicitly uh, expressed by god that he was in eden the garden of god so this shining one is also in eden the garden of god the shining one in genesis 3 was in eden uh, the garden of god uh, let's quickly look at it in uh, isaiah 14. in isaiah 14 it's actually in verse 13 where it says you said in your heart i will ascend to the heavens i will rise my throne above the stars of god and uh, i will preside on the mountain of the gods so 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 here uh, it's it's not a garden per se but he's saying uh, i will uh, preside on the mountain of the gods another version says i will sit in the assembly of the gods and we have an understanding when we study the garden of eden that um you know we, we, eden was 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 thought to be a place a dwelling place physical dwelling place of god and uh, you know that wherever there is a physical place dwelling place of god um there will be cherubims and seraphims the bible says god uh, it, it, it dwells amongst the cherubim so ever there is there is a dwelling physical dwelling place of god there will be a presence of um, um what is this the seraphims and, and the cherubims you know so here in isaiah he says he does not say garden per se but he says i'll preside uh, on the mountain of the gods you know or on the mountain or on the assembly of the gods so we see that uh, just as much as he said mountain is the same idea of of eden which is a dwelling place of god so uh, we see an insinuation of it at least here in isaiah and in ezekiel it's explicit that it's the garden of god eden and also in genesis uh, chapter 3 uh, we see obviously these people are in the garden of eden as much as we do not have an account or that they communicated with other heavenly beings we know that they were at least aware that there were other heavenly beings. When 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 this serpent communicates with Eve and say, when he says that the day you eat of it, uh, your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When 
we study this word you shall be as gods it's you shall be as heavenly princes we understand that they were at least aware of these gods that satan is talking about in uh, genesis chapter 3 verse 5 so they, they were that's one thing we know when we study the statement you shall be as gods uh, we begin to understand that Adam and Eve were actually aware of other beings besides uh, the giraffes and the lions that were in the garden. And those beings were spiritual beings. They were princes. They were principalities. You know, so uh, there were cherubims. There were different types of beings in, in the garden of Eden. So it was not only them, you know. So we know that wherever God dwells physically, there is a presence of, of heavenly beings, you know. So, uh, at least, though we don't have an account that they spoke to them before, we know that they definitely were aware uh, of other beings. So, that's why it was easy for, 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 their, for, say, for, for, for Eve to, to say, I will become like that, you know, because they were of a different nature and they were of a different seed. So, when he says you become like God, it was something that Eve was aware of. And that's why also when this... Uh, Nakash comes to if and they communicate. That's why they, there is no sense of fear, no sense of terror, no sense of surprise because it was uh, it was something that they were accustomed to, that we are not alone here, there's God, but there are also heavenly beings here. Now let's get back to the point that I was trying to establish before I was talking about the shining ones being in Eden, uh, which is uh, being cast into the ground and eating the dust of your belly. In Isaiah 14 verse 9, it says, The realm of the dead below you is stirred up to meet you and to greet you at your coming. And in chapter 14 verse 12, it says, uh, You have been cast down to the ground or you've been cast down to earth. Now, uh, we, it's, chapter 28 verse 17 says, I, I, I cast you to the earth or I threw you uh, to the earth. You, you know, so uh, so here, uh, both in these books, there's being cast to the earth. And we like we said that when you study this, being cast to the earth, or being cast to the ground, um, it's a similar idea that says it's not only on the earth, but it's uh, below the earth, you know. So in all these three books, uh, this idea is found, you know. Uh, so there are four or there are three or four similar ideas that are communicated uh, in Genesis chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. So, but why is it important for us to understand this whole idea of the Nakash and Adam? in Eden. It's important for us because we get to understand the magnanimity of what Adam lost. You know, in the church, we are taught that God had bestowed uh, the authority in Adam to be a steward of the whole earth. And then when he disobeyed God by eating that fruit, uh, he lost authority. So that's what we're only taught, that uh, Adam lost authority over the earth. But it cost Adam and even us more than that. It cost God more than that. The first thing that it cost it is, is, is that it cost humanity to lose heaven. You know, when in Eden, Eden was a type of a paradise. It was a type of a heaven that God deposited here on earth. Thank God for Jesus Christ and the cross and for, that we are being reconciled back to God. We are reconciled back to God, but it's a fractured uh, relationship in a sense of uh, the way God honestly desired to live with us. So we need to understand this because that's what we ought to pursue to restore. We, we need to pursue to restore that which Adam had lost, like Enoch. Enoch lived with heavenly beings. He lived with God. He, he lived in heaven. E Enoch, one day, he took a walk and he didn't know how to come back to earth. You know, so the Bible says, God took him. That's what we lost, man. We lost that sweet and fractured uh, fellowship and connection uh, with invisibility with God. So, uh, and now, between us and God, there is Satan, you know, so... so it was not only authority uh, over the animals and over the plants, but it was the home for God and it was also a fellowship with God, uh, the, the way men lived with God. You know? So uh, it, it cost humanity everything. So thank you so much. I, I hope you understand um, 
where I was trying to go with this, that uh, when the, the kind of person that a uh, Satan was uh, before, before, before the fall of man. Thank you so much.